Good evening. I'm Albert Kreinersale, the Dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And on behalf of the school and the Institute of Politics, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Many have celebrated 1992 as the year of the woman. For tonight's speaker, every year is the year of the woman. She's devoted a career to ensuring that the promotion of women is not a one-time or a one-year occurrence, but is a continuing, sustained, vital activity. We salute her commitment to breaking down the barriers that women still face as individuals and collectively. Our speaker is Patricia Ireland, president of the National Organization of Women, NOW. She has served the feminist movement since the 1970s. While a flight attendant, she came up against the Pan American Airways policy that did not provide her husband with dental insurance, although it did so for the wives of male employees. With the help of the NOW office in Dade County, Florida, she managed to get the policy changed and came to appreciate the power of the law and of lawyers. Uh, Mrs. Ireland summed up the episode with her usual humor. She said, and I quote, the vice president of the labor task force at Dade County, at Dade County now, is now the dean of women lawmakers in the Florida legislature. I am the president of now, and Pan Am is bankrupt, <laughs> close quote. While working as a flight attendant, Ms. Ireland earned a law degree from the University of Miami. She became a partner at a Miami law firm, and for seven years served as legal counsel to now organizations in Florida. In 1985, Ms. Ireland managed Eleanor Smeal's successful campaign for the presidency of now, and two years later, she herself was elected executive vice president. In December of 1991, Ms. Ireland became the ninth president of NOW, and the organization has flourished under her leadership. As president, it's her responsibility to refine and to pursue NOW's agenda. There are many items that this includes, but among them are protecting abortion rights, improving women's economic status, reviving the Equal Rights Amendment, expanding lesbian rights, and preventing violence against women. Now uses a grassroots approach, as well as lobbying and legislation to achieve these goals. In addition to being a strong advocate for American women, Ms. Ireland is truly a global feminist. She has been the prime architect of Now's global feminist programs and initiated the January 1992 Global Feminist Conference to celebrate Now's 25th anniversary. It was attended by women from more than 45 countries. Recent events, like the Clarence Hill, Anita Thomas, uh, Clarence Hill, how's that? I didn't, I didn't want to tell you about the marriage, but now, uh, the Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill hearings, the debates over the Family Leave and Freedom of Choice Acts, the publicity surrounding employment of illegal aliens as domestic workers, the tailhook incident, and even Hillary Rodham Clinton's name change have raised our nation's consciousness about these issues. Patricia Island has been a strong and consistent voice for women throughout this tumultuous period. One of her great assets is her wonderful sense of humor. Whether it's deflecting discussion of her shoe selection by asking when people will talk about her hairstyle and makeup, or her assertion that she would, quote, like to be arrested for laughing, close quote. She shows that humor can be an effective means for achieving her serious goals. She probably also appreciates the 1982 remarks made by Florida State Senator Dick Anderson, who opposed ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, now led a campaign against Senator Anderson. And though the ERA lost, so did Anderson. He railed against his detractors, stating, quote, these now women are horrible, unfeminine shrews, except for that lovely Patricia Ireland. <laughs> I can't believe she's mixed up with them, <laughs> close quote. Well, well, former Senator Anderson, she's not mixed up with those now women. She's leading them boldly into the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming the president of the National Organization for Women, Patricia Ireland. Thank you. For 
Joe, you brought back some wonderful memories, um, both of being a flight attendant and of chasing Dick Anderson out of office. Um, I, I can't help but, but flash back on some of that. You know, when I started with Pan American, I started flying in 1967. Um, I got out of law school, I got out of undergraduate school in 66 and started flying in 67. And at that time, they had just changed a whole series of work rules um, that required, for instance, that flight attendants, and we were then known as stewardesses, uh, retire at age 32 or when we got married, whichever came first. Um, we knew, of course, that the reason that they wanted us to, fl to retire at age 32 or when we got married had nothing to do with the ad campaigns, for instance, of Continental Airlines that say we really knew move our tails for you, or of National Airlines, which at the time had an ad campaign, I'm Cheryl, fly me. It had nothing to do with that imagery that they were trying to promote. It had only to do with the safety of the passengers. Now, you laugh, but I know it was because they wanted strong, vigorous women who could pull a 125-pound life raft out of the overhead compartment, get it out over the wing, inflate it, and evacuate the plane in 90 seconds. I'm sure that was the reason. <laughs> uh, but that was the reason that they still had that leftover work rule that said that the families of the male employees, including the men who were flying with me, by that time they'd also been sued and changed the work rule that said only women could be flight attendants, uh, that the men's families were covered by our health insurance and the women's were not, was a leftover from that era when women were not allowed to have families legally and still be employed. Um, and despite the changes in the, uh, the workforce, the, the rules lagged somewhat behind. Um, it, it is fun sometimes to reflect on those earlier periods because I think they inform us in terms of our optimism about the future. And in answering the question that was uh, put to me and, and on the flyers around advertising this, which was whether the feminist movement has helped women. I, again, have only to think about my early life to recognize that that is true. Uh, when I was in college, when I was just starting out as an adult, um, people still argued that you didn't need, women didn't need equal pay for equal work. It sounds sort of quaint now, but the arguments went something like, uh, well, we didn't have families to support, there's that image again. Uh, we were probably taking some man's job anyway, and women just worked for the little extras, what they called pin money then. Now, of course, because of the work that the feminist movement did, even the most conservative politician starts out by saying, well, I believe in equal pay for equal work, but, and then they tell you what they don't quite get yet. <laughs> when I was a young woman, uh, again, just becoming an adult, birth control was still illegal even for married couples in some states. And I'm only 47 years old. This is not, you know, like 100 years ago. Um, <laughs> And of course, abortion was illegal and it was the number one cause of maternal death in the country. And now, although it's under siege, we do have the right to birth control and abortion. I am old enough to remember when childcare was a commie plot. <laughs> now, that was the first year that I was in law school, actually, and the childcare bill came out of Congress in 1972 and it was vetoed by Richard Nixon in a scathing red-baiting message written by Pat Buchanan, just to bring it current. <laughs> Nixon called child care the Sovietization of American children. Now even Orrin Hatch says we need child care. That makes me nervous. <laughs> He's clearly not thinking of what we are thinking of. And in fact, when the child care bill, the Act for Better Child Care, did come out of Congress, the argument was not whether we needed federally funded child care, but whether uh, child care institutions that received federal funding could discriminate based on religion and gender in the hiring of teachers and admission of students to their programs. And the Congress answered yes. Uh, so while we've made some progress, there's still an awful lot of compromises that have been made along the way and an awful lot of work to be done. But there's so many examples of how feminism has helped women and how we've moved forward in, in the 20 or 25 years of this wave of feminism. I guess now it's more like 25 or 30 years of this wave of feminism. We've gained equal pay laws, equal credit laws, equal education laws. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act was passed. At the state level, we gained um, uh, funding for battered women's shelters and for rape crisis centers. We've moved forward um, even in shaping the language as we've 
as we've begun talking about firefighters and police officers, I think more young women can see themselves in those uniforms. As we coined phrase like, uh, phrases like, every mother's a working mother, and women who work outside the home, we've strived to gain the respect and the recognition of the value of women's work, whether it's the underpaid jobs in the workforce or the unpaid jobs at home. Um, and so I know that when we fight back, I know that when we organize and work hard in the political arena and in the social arena, we can win. We can make change. We have done it before, and we're doing it right before your very eyes. And what I'm here to do is to urge more and more of us to take an active role in that. Because there's a lot to celebrate. We have made great progress. Um, and at the same time, what we have gained did not come about inevitably. And what we have still to gain is not going to happen without the same commitment and the same activism that the first 20 or 25 years um, brought us. Now, when we start talking about the feminist movement, of course, many people have a big question mark there because they don't know what a feminist is. Uh, a lot of people think they know what a feminist is. Pat Robertson thinks he knows what a feminist <laughs> is. Um, he put out a fundraising letter this year during the Iowa ERA campaign, and in the fundraising letter he said that the uh, feminist movement had nothing to do with equality, that what the movement was about was a movement designed to teach women to leave their children, kill their, no, leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. <laughs> it's quite an agenda. Um, but having heard that definition of what feminism was about and hearing in the media constantly that feminism is the new F word, I thought I would give you some of my favorite definitions instead. Um, I looked in the dictionary, and that's rather boring. It says that feminism is a, a seeking social, legal, political, and economic equality for women. Yawn. So I looked on the t-shirt of a young man at the University of Miami in the now chapter there. And on his t-shirt, he had one of my favorite definitions. It is, feminism is the radical notion that women are people. <laughs> but I still think I like Rebecca West's uh, definition best. Rebecca West, in the early part of this century, said, I myself have never been able to determine exactly what feminism is. I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat. <laughs> and since I know none of you are doormats, I will assume that I am among friendly uh, company here. Um, there has been a tremendous change in Washington. I'm sure that you saw it around the country. The dean alluded to it in talking about the year of the woman, although that term offends me. I can't figure out why the guys got the first 200 years and we were only supposed to get one. Um, but I, um, I do think there's a lot to celebrate. I, uh, uh, remember very well being in the Senate gallery as Dianne Feinstein was sworn in. You, you do understand, of course, that on the floor of the Senate there is not supposed to be any human emotion. Um, it's just not done, it's just not decorous. And so as Dianne Feinstein was being sworn in, um, the gallery was full. It looked very much like this. I mean, just jammed with people like me who'd been working so hard to get women into the U.S. Senate and campaign workers and family and friends and former school teachers of Dianne Feinstein, people who really cared about her being uh, in the U.S. Senate. And so when they swore her in, the gallery went wild. And I do not mean polite applause. I mean, hoo, 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 hoo. I mean, people were just wild and, and the senators started to twitch. It was... <laughs> There's other rather dramatic changes in the Senate. Women have a bathroom now in the U.S. Senate, all right? I think that's, I think that's progress. Um, it is not, the power to command a bathroom within a bladder's distance of the floor of the Senate is not the power necessarily to get through controversial legislation, but it's a start. Um, we have all kinds of changes. I mean, we tripled the number of women in the U.S. Senate, which sounds ever so much better than saying we went from two to six. Uh, we added enough women in the Congress to move from five to 10% women in Congress, and that is a dramatic breakthrough. 
In the same way that we doubled the percentage of women in Congress, we doubled the representation of people in, of color, including the first African American woman in the United States Senate, the first Native American man in the United States Senate in 60 years, the first Korean American man, the first Puerto Rican uh, from New York City, uh, Nidia Velasquez, the first Chicana, uh, Lucille Royball Allard from uh, Southern California. We have some tremendous changes just in the look of the, um, of the Senate and the House. And it's, it's very, very important. And while some of it is funny, I mean, I think the women's bathroom is fun. And at the same time, it also promote, prompted one of my favorite editorial cartoons, uh, which was a man going into the men's room of the Senate, looking down the hall rather warily at a door marked powder room. <laughs> And coming out of the powder room is a very large cannon. And a woman's inside about to light the powder. Um, and I think it somewhat reflected the anxiety with which some of the men in power welcome us <laughs> to the Congress. Um, I think they're just not quite sure what's, uh, what's coming at them. But I can't imagine that it's not going to make a lot of uh, more serious differences as well. Uh, because I know that women bring to public policy a different experience in life, and we therefore bring a different set of priorities. Now, that is a gross generalization, subject to the same flaws as any gross generalization. But the fact is that, in largest part, women in elected office and in appointed office have been champions of different issues. Um, for example, women still face although we've closed it some, a, a tremendous wage gap. The economic empowerment of women is not yet complete. And so we look and we see that women who are employed full-time, year-round, make about 70 cents for every dollar men make. Now that means that for a woman to make what a man makes working nine to five, she would have to work until 8.30 at night. And then who would make dinner? <laughs> Because, uh, as we know, we've got the major responsibility for our families as well. And so I think it's important that when the United States Senate was debating the Family and Medical Leave Act, which finally got out of Congress, we were able to see Diane Feinstein and Patty Murray on the floor of the Senate telling their stories that when they were first pregnant and had their families, they had to quit their jobs because there was no leave policy available. Um, I think that it makes a difference that we have a Lynn Woolsey in Congress, a woman who's not only been a single mother, but a mother on welfare. And I think that when the welfare reform proposals come through, if they are in fact being punitive towards poor women and children, as if they were to blame for the economic mess our country's in, it's going to be important that we have someone like Lynn Woolsey, for whom this is a personal experience, not an abstraction. Uh, we know far too well, of course, that um, women face incredible violence. And the fear of that violence is a terrible, paralyzing, uh, has a terrible, paralyzing impact on our ability to take part in fully in the social and political and economic life of the country. I mean, a woman is raped every three to six minutes. A woman is beaten every 15 to 18 seconds. And on top of all of the crimes that all the men in the audience fear, we have this additional layer of, of uh, violence in our own homes and on the streets. And we face that in a way that's very, very personal. So it doesn't surprise me at all that on the Violence Against Women bill in Congress, the women in Congress across party lines 74% of them are co-sponsors taking leadership on the Violence Against Women bill, which will help educate law enforcement officials, educate the judiciary. It'll put money into campus lighting programs and give incentives to um, uh, states to provide for mandatory arrests of uh, wife batterers. Uh, there's so many important elements there. Now, 74% of the women, but only 47% of the men are on as co-sponsors. Now, I value those men, those 47% of the men in the Congress who are on that, um, on that bill as co-sponsors. And I not to, it's not to say that we don't have some very good friends in Congress who are men, but it is to say that we need to have a far greater number of women there. I, I was on a radio talk show the other day, and some young man came up uh, on the line and 
Um, he established his bona fides first by telling me that his mother was a feminist and his father was a feminist and he was a feminist, but, and you could hear the but coming, <laughs> but aren't you ever satisfied? Um, well, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> So we've got six women in Congress, I, in, in the Senate. I will be satisfied when we have 50% women, 50 seats in the Senate, 50% of the House, half of the cabinet. Um, I know that it'll make a difference. I know that Carrie Meek being in the Congress makes a difference. She's one, uh, we've moved from one African-American woman to 10 in the last two elections. Carrie Meek's being there will make a difference. Carrie Meek is the granddaughter of slaves. I, I think it's hard for some of us who are white Anglos to recognize how recently and how devastating the impact of slavery has been on our society and on African Americans in our society. I don't know about you, I remember my grandparents well. They, they helped shape who I, be, who I am today. They influenced how I grew up. Carrie's grandparents were slaves. Her parents were sharecroppers. She grew up working somebody else's land for a subsistence existence. I think that she will bring a valuable perspective to the Congress. It's a different experience in life, and I'm so glad that she's going to be there um, and, and representing a point of view that's been largely absent from the halls of power. Well, as we see all these changes and, and we um, have a, a great deal to celebrate, I think that we also need to look forward at where we're going. And in the same way that we need to push to get the Violence Against Women bill passed here, and at the same way there are pending in the state legislature, uh, I'm sorry, we need to get the Violence Against Women bill passed in Washington, I forget where I'm speaking. And here in Massachusetts, we've got some state proposals for um, um, a, do, a check off system, for instance, to fund battered women's shelters on, on uh, tax returns and a proposal to expand the victim's compensation bill to include the rape survivors um, in that victim's compensation uh, uh, bill. There's, there's a number of I other items that we need to look at. Um, one of them relates to the double burden that um, I spoke of when I said who will make dinner. And it came about and it came to our attention in part because of moving more women into positions of power, because the, the Clinton administration was looking for a woman to move into the cabinet, and in particular for attorney general. And so we saw this sequence of, of Zoe Baird and Kimba Wood and then Janet Reno finally um, being named. And I think that was very instructive about a, a, a set of issues that we have to address. Um, now, unfortunately, in a way, it came up in the context of Zoe Baird. And I think Zoe Baird was, to many people, a fairly unsympathetic character. Now, I would also give you a little parenthetical and say that I think that there is a resentment and an irritation and a backlash against women with wealth. Um, and I think that while Ron Brown may make three quarters of a million dollars last year and nobody bats an eye, Zoe Baird making a half a million sort of pissed people off. Okay, so she's a rich bitch. We start there. She is a bad mother. Remember Joe Biden um, grilling her? What time do you go to work in the morning? Well, what time do you get home at night? Well, how much time do you spend with your young son? I mean, can you imagine if that had been Joey Baird instead of Zoe Baird, that he would have ever asked those questions? I don't think so. Um, and yet, um, she was not only a, a, a rich woman, and a, and a bad mother, she was a dirty lawbreaker, so she had to go. Uh, she had hired undocumented workers, like an estimated three quarters of the people in this country did not report um, the domestic help that she had in her home. So she had to go. Well, then what happened with Kimba Wood, for goodness sake? She was apparently supposed to use her women's intuition to anticipate that they were going to change the law and comply with it in advance. Because uh, she hadn't broken the law, but she had to go as well. Well, the rumors around Washington then started to be that to name a woman as attorney general, Clinton was going to have to name a childless woman with a dirty house. <laughs> and along came Janet Reno, a childless woman with a dirty house. Okay. Um, and in the one sense, I think it's sort of a, a, a funny uh, rendition of history. And in another sense, it's very serious. I mean, is this the choice that women are supposed to make? When we look at the Fortune 500 companies, for instance, and we see that among managers in the Fortune 500 companies, the women who are there 
fully half of them have not had children. Half of them do not have kids if they're in management in Fortune 500 countries, companies. The men who are similarly situated, 95% of them have kids. They don't have to make that choice. And I think that it's, it's really unconscionable that we are still sitting here pretending like that is not a major, major burden for women. So we carry this double burden, but then on top of it, we get the double talk. We have a society that says, oh, how we value children. We profess this great love for babies. And this work is so important. Child care is so important. You women are really respected and revered for doing this. This is the highest calling for women. But we're going to punish you for it. Um, for example, you, um, if you take time off from your job to take care of kids, you will have, if they're your own kids, big zeros, goose eggs, averaged into your Social Security record for those years, which means that your wages, which are already lower than men's, your average wage is brought way down by those zeros. At the very least, if we really do want to put our money where our mouths are, we better at least knock out those years and take the real average wage. But I would urge that we, in fact, give value to the work that women do in caregiving and not average in zeros, but put some value to that for Social Security purposes. What we have now is a Social Security system that ends up with women getting about two-thirds what men do under the Social Security payments as old women. Um, look at the immigration laws. The immigration laws which tripped uh, Zoe Baird and Kimba Wood up, they define child care as unskilled labor. Unskilled labor, which means that a woman who wants to come to this country to do child care or other domestic work waits for 12 or 15 years to get a green card that allows her to do that. Well, in the meantime, what does that mean? It means there's this huge pool of undocumented workers known as illegal aliens to Dif distinguish them from the Martians who were here lawfully, I guess. Um, and, and they are subject to terrible exploitation. There is a whole pool. There is an underground domestic worker uh, economy that has not only these undocumented workers, but also women who are on Social Security and can't make ends meet. And so they take in the neighborhood kids for a few dollars under the table. They don't want it reported. They lose their Social Security payments. Women on welfare in half the states in this country get less than the poverty level. The welfare payments bring them up below poverty level, and they're trying to keep their family together and their heads above water. And they, don't, they work off the books. They don't want it reported if they're doing domestic work for you. Um, so it is, it is a, a system that hurts women up and down the line. And in fact, the less money you make, the more likely you are to be involved in some way in the domestic worker underground. Um, and so I think that we have got to really focus on these issues of caregiving, both through the health care reform. We need long-term care for elder as well as um, uh, others. We need child care. We need an infrastructure that includes not just roads and bridges, but child care centers and health care centers. We need to reform the immigration laws and the social security laws and the welfare laws. All of those need to be in the mix as we move forward um, in this new administration. Well, at the same time, um, of course, the other thing that we see is that um, in some ways not all that much has changed. While the tailhook report is about to be made public this week uh, or next, uh, we still don't see, despite all of the talk and all of the rhetoric, a lot of change on sexual harassment. And in fact, this new Senate, uh, which supposedly gets it now, post Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, was prepared to seat Senator Bob Packwood without even acknowledging that five petitions had been filed against him. At that time, 10 and now 23 women have come forward to say not just that he verbally harassed them, but that he physically assaulted them. This is a man who forced his tongue in unwilling women's mouths. This is a man who chased a woman uh, into an office, yanked her ponytail, stood on her feet so she couldn't get away, and tried to pull her undergarments off. He lied about these stories before the election. He was in the election of his life. He was in a very close race with Les O'Coin. Told the Washington Post reporter that none of it was true, that he wanted time to review his records and to dig up discrediting information on these women. Started feeding the paper stories about these women, suggesting that the, one of them had a crush on him, and that's why she was doing this. 
um, all kinds of reasons that these women were, were not telling the truth. And then with the election safely behind him, having won his seat again for six years, got up in front of a news conference and decided that he was going to um, say he wasn't going to contest the charges. And that in fact, he just didn't get it. But he gets it now. And it's all supposed to be all right now. I, I think it is such an insult to every man in this audience, every man on the Hill, for anybody to say that even pre-Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, anybody thought it was okay to physically assault women and that he just didn't get it. Um, and I think that we need to keep the pressure on the Senate to move forward with that investigation and indeed to unseat him. Because while I think that um, they, they, there is possibility for change I believe in change. That's what I'm doing in a mo movement for social change. I think he should change back in Oregon. I don't think there's any room for that kind of abuse of power in the United States Senate. Um, and I mean, <laughs> now I know we can make a difference even there. We, they came back from their um, break over the winter, January, they came back to work. Um, and the day before they were going to be sworn in, which was a Tuesday they were going to be sworn in, we found out that indeed no one was prepared to step forward on the floor of the Senate and challenge Packwood's being seated. In fact, we made real nuisances of ourselves, went around like wet blankets to all of the parties that were going on before the um, new members of Congress were sworn in and kept buttonholing people asking them about Packwood. Um, we found out that they weren't going to do anything, so we threw up what we call a zap action. We had a send Packwood packing picket outside of the Senate office building on Monday at noontime. It was a slow news day. It was a good photo. We made the front page top of the fold in several newspapers around the country, um, the LA Times and a, a number of other papers. And we started a blitz as well. That is, we started visiting the senators, calling the senators, sending POMs. We called out to our states and got people, other people to call their senators. And by Tuesday morning, we had turned up the heat so high just in that brief period that when the Democrats went into their caucus meeting that morning, it was the Democratic senators themselves who put the pressure on Mitchell to say, hey, you all got to do something. And so Senator Mitchell went on the floor of the Senate before they were sworn in and announced, acknowledged that Packwood was being seated conditionally subject to the outcome of these pending proceedings against him. And I think that while that was not a total victory, it was again an important sign that even this new Senate left to their own devices is not all that new but that they will respond to constituents that if we turn up the heat, if we keep letting them know we're watching, it will make a difference. Um, I know that it will make a difference on lesbians and gays in the military, for instance. Um, and I think that's another uh, issue that's front and center right now. Now, when, back up a minute. When I was talking about Janet Reno, um, and, and the joke was that uh, the woman that was going to be attorney general, if it was going to be a woman, was going to have to be a childless woman with a dirty house. Um, what happened when a childless woman who was unmarried stepped forward? Everybody started whispering, she must be queer. I mean, that went up. I don't know if it came to Boston, but it was certainly in the papers in Florida and Washington, and it was on the buzz line. I mean, everybody was a wonderfully gossipy town, Washington is. Um, and so, you know, you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, if, if, uh, if you are an assertive woman who is seeking to move into a position of power, there's going to be stumbling blocks thrown in your way. Um, and one of them is often this lesbian baiting that comes forward. We see it in the military in particular uh, around, for instance, the issue of sexual harassment. And women in the military who are sexually harassed and fight back against it often then, as part of the retaliation, are charged with being lesbians. I think that the thinking goes something like this. Oh, she doesn't want me? <laughs> Any real woman would want me. She must be one of those others. <laughs> Um, or just out of meanness, because um, a, a woman also who is, I mean, the military is just by itself a non-traditional job. But women who try to move into non-traditional jobs, um, women in the military who seek jobs um, that are traditionally uh, reserved to men, are often both lesbian baited and sexually harassed 
It just seems to go with the territory, but I think we've got to put a stop to it. Um, it is the case that we see in the military uh, not just a, a microcosm, but I think a magnification of the same issues that we face in the civilian sector. And the sexual harassment is one of them, and the lesbian baiting is another, but the job segregation is another big one. The job segregation in the military sets half of the jobs off limits to women. And if you want to talk about quotas, there is a quota for the number of women who can be in the military because they set these jobs off limits saying that they are combat. Now we know, especially since the Gulf War, that in today's modern warfare, the front line can be a 30-second missile flight from Baghdad, and that the so-called combat exclusion did not protect any of those military women in the Gulf. Indeed, all it protects is men's jobs in the military. And I think that when we look at that overall picture, we've got to recognize that these are all ways that women are being held back. I thought it was sort of amusing in a, in a uh, I have a perverse sense of humor sometimes. But when they were talking about lesbians and gays in the military and there was this proposal floated that maybe they could be segregated and kept out of combat, and all the gay men started going, they're going to treat us like women? I mean, there was this great insult, you know, like, well, they're, they're going to, excuse me, they can't segregate us and keep us out of these jobs. I mean, that's what they're doing to women right now. Um, there's, there are some amusing aspects of this. I mean, the, the truth is that I have never heard so much about gay men in the showers. <laughs> have you? I mean, do, there's, this, there's this terrible um, fear of gay men in the showers. <laughs> um, I, like they've been sending themselves out to be dry cleaned up to this point. They're not in the showers now. No, they're in the military, but they're not in the showers now. It's. Um, I mean, as nearly as we can tell, what this fear is, is that the fear of straight men in the military, that they are going to be sexually harassed the way they have been harassing women all these years, you know? <laughs> but it is very serious. And in fact, the, the ban on lesbians and gays in the military does work against women most strongly. Women in the military are three times more likely than men to be charged with being lesbians and to be discharged from the military because of that allegation. Um, it, in, the, in the Marines, it's eight times more likely to be discharged for allegations that they're lesbians. And so it is a women's issue. It's a women's issue because it affects women directly. It's a women's issue because women's issues include fighting oppression of all kinds. And it's a women's issue because as long as this threat of being called a lesbian carries with it such real penalties, as long as you can still lose your job and your credit and your housing, no matter how good you are at your job or how often you pay your bills or what kind of a tenant you are, as long as you can lose the custody of your own children, irrespective of what kind of a parent you are, just because of being charged with being a lesbian or a gay man, that's a very real weapon that's used against us to keep women from joining the women's rights movement out of fear that if they are included in the feminist movement, they will be automatically charged with being lesbians. And until it reaches the point where, um, where there is civil rights protection, where these threats don't, they ring hollow, until it reaches the point where when some guy comes up and says, oh, you're in now? Are you a lesbian? You can just laugh and say, what, are you the alternative? <laughs> And it's, and it's no more serious than that, um, then I think we're going to be held back. Um, I know that, um, <laughs> that we, are, we are seeing this issue of lesbians and gays as an issue that the religious right wing is using, as a new wedge issue, as an issue that um, as more and more of a consensus has grown in our country in favor of abortion rights as the charge of baby killer rings less and less uh, true for, for most people in the society. I think that this new issue of lesbians and gays is an organizing vehicle, a fundraising vehicle for the religious right wing. And I think for that reason as well, we have to take it very seriously. It, like abortion, is an emotional issue that can be cast in moral terms and brings together a constituency, the politicized religious right wing, um, in a way that's very threatening. The other place that we are seeing that, of course, is in the abortion rights fight. And unfortunately, um, we're seeing it in a very, very vicious way. Um, right after the, in our, right before the inauguration, I should say, the Supreme Court 
gave us uh, a decision in a case that now took to the court against Operation Rescue. It was a case called Bray versus Alexandria Women's Health Center. And in that case, the Supreme Court sided with the mobs at the clinics and sided against the health care providers and the women in this country. And we brought that case under the civil rights law, the post-Civil War civil rights law called 1985-3, um, which is known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. And what the court basically said is that the um, Operation Rescue had not shown any discriminatory animus toward women, only toward those of us who wanted to exercise our rights. It would be very much like saying under the Klan Act that um, there was not a discriminatory animus toward African Americans who um, didn't try to exercise their rights, only those who wanted to go to school or wanted to vote, um, and wanted to have the vote. And so I think that um, what we saw there was the Supreme Court very clearly um, being blinded by their anti-abortion bias in that case. We're still seeking uh, judicial remedies. We have a case pending now before the court where we are asking them to review conflicting decisions in the, um, in the appellate court level on the racketeering laws. Um, our theory, and it's been upheld in the Third Circuit and knocked out in the Seventh, is that by using force and threats of force to coerce people into giving up something of value, in this case a valuable constitutional right or the right to practice medicine, they are engaging in extortion and that extortion over a pattern of, of years is racketeering. Um, as I say, it's been upheld in Philadelphia. It's been knocked out in Chicago. We're asking the court to review that. We're also going under antitrust, saying that these people are using illegal means to try to put legitimate businesses out of business, and by doing that, restricting the um, choices available to consumers and increasing the cost, decreasing the competition and increasing the cost. I don't know whether the court is going to um, buy into any of those arguments. And I fear that with this court, we're going to have to write a new statute, a statute that is so clear that even they can't mistake it, to say that there is a need for federal involvement in these attacks on health care workers and their families and the women that they serve. Now, right after the Bray decision in January, on February 5th, a firebomb uh, uh, leveled a clinic in Venice, Florida. And on February 22nd, a firebomb leveled a clinic in Corpus Christi, Texas. And about two weeks ago, a firebomb leveled a clinic in Missoula, Montana. Have you heard of any of those? I mean, is it strange to you that none of this is being reported? That David Gunn's murder shot in the back three times um, in a cowardly and tragic incident was the only thing that's been reported out of all of these incidents of fire bombings, of, of death threats, of stalking children at school. A year ago um, in St. Louis, a man walked into a clinic and shot two people, one of whom is now a paraplegic. She will never walk again in her life because she was a receptionist in an abortion clinic. You probably didn't hear about that one either. Um, there is a dramatic increase in the violence and it's not just what you see in the 30-second or 20-second clip on the news of Operation Rescue. It is going on at people's homes. The people are being tracked to, their, to restaurants, to their beauty parlors. Um, it is a very frightening um, scenario. A week after David Gunn was murdered, 33,000 medical students received a mailing that was called The Bottom Feeders, and it was a six-page joke book. Um, the jokes were things like this, a riddle. You're in, an or you're in a room with uh, Mussolini, Hitler, and an abortionist. You have a gun that has only two bullets. What do you do? Answer, shoot the abortionist twice. Now, this was sent to medical students all over the country. I think that is such a clear um, uh, nationwide, there is such a clear nationwide effort to put uh, this right into the category of being hollow rights, right that it, rights that exist on paper but can't be um, utilized, can't be accessed. And I think that while Clinton and Reno, that is President Clinton and Attorney General Reno, have made all the right noises, we have yet to see any federal involvement. We have yet to hear that the FBI is undertaking this investigation. We only hear from the federal government and the state of Florida that this is an isolated incident. I think that there is at least moral, if not legal, culpability 
by someone like Don Treshman from Rescue America, who came over from Texas to organize in Pensacola, Florida, the demonstration at, with, at which um, Michael Griffin killed David Gunn. I think that when we have Randy Terry out in California giving speeches that say, um, we may be past the window where America can be saved without bloodshed. I don't know whose blood is going to have to be shed. And yet we still see no federal involvement. Um, we don't see this freedom of access to clinics bill moving forward so that the Supreme Court can no longer say to us, I'm sorry, it's not a federal matter. Um, and I think that is an area where we are going to have to work very hard to make sure that we don't lose by bullets what we gained at the ballot in 1992. And that none of us can afford to become complacent about reproductive freedom, even with Clinton in the White House, who has lifted the gag rule and lifted the ban on fetal tissue research and moved forward on getting RU-46 into this country and made so many steps to say that he wants to remove the Hyde Amendment so that poor women have access to abortion. Let us not get complacent. Remember what happened in 73 when the Roe v. Wade decision came down and people thought the battle was won. And since then, uh, we've seen how dangerous that can be. And so I'm here to urge you to get involved. There are so many issues. There are so many ways that, that we need to move forward. And you can get involved at whatever level your comfort is. Um, I, of course, would like you all to become now members and to become activists in the feminist movement. And this is a commercial. You can join now. Um, but I want your money and your life. I, I want you to join now. I want you to become an activist. I want you to come on April 25th this month and march in Washington for lesbian, gay, and bi rights. I, I, we need to have you there. We need for you to get in touch with senators and, and members of Congress about the Freedom of Choice Act, which is now a bait and switch. It's a fake Freedom of Choice Act. It doesn't cover poor women. It doesn't cover young women. And there's a whole slew of other restrictions that they're threatening to put on that bill. We need you to lobby about the freedom of access to clinic entrances. Remember, these guys are home on their spring break. You can go see them now. You could go see them tomorrow. You could call up their district office. You could send them a letter. You could take some sort of action. Um, you could come to the National Now Conference, 4th of July weekend at the Boston Sheraton. Um, it's going to be a great conference. Women and men from all over the country will be here to plan on these very issues, how we move forward. Now, I know that some of you will not go march. Some of you will never be activists. Okay, there's a plan for you, too. Um, <laughs> you can do the lobbying. Uh, you can... Um, also use your positions in everyday life to move forward. I mean, some of you who are in school now, some of you who are here at the, at the Kennedy School and some of you who are in undergraduate and law school, you will be in positions of some power. One of the greatest advances we've made in the last 25 or 30 years is that we've moved so many women and women's rights supporters into the institutions that shape our society, into law and medicine and the arts and media and the sciences and religion. Um, into academia. I think it's so important that when you get into those positions, or if you are in those positions, you, you're there as a role model and a mentor, but you can also start making change from the inside of those institutions. Um, even in the Bush administration, which I think was obsessed with denying the impact of racism and sexism, we had Lynn Martin in the, just, in the Labor Department who put forward the, the glass ceiling initiative, which drew critically needed attention to the issue of women and people of color being held down. Um, we had Bernadine Healy moving forward on issues of women's health. And I think that we have to recognize that as we're in those positions, we carry a responsibility um, to make a difference. Now, some of you will never be in positions of power. I hate to be the one to tell you this. Um, <laughs> But you all have personal power. You all have the ability to vote. You have the ability to run for office. You have the ability in day-to-day -day life to say when somebody says, tells a racist or a sexist or a homophobic joke, I don't think that's funny. Maybe you could explain it to me. I don't get it. Um, you have the ability to um, speak up when your professors are, are teaching you something that you think is sexist. Um, you have the, uh, well, I have done that, in fact, um, and I know that it can be done. It also means, however, that they will then know your name and call on you all throughout the rest of the semester, so you can get an education as well as make a difference in that class. 
Um, you can make a difference in your family. You know, you're sitting around the Sunday dinner table and your favorite uncle, Fred, who you've always liked. Gosh, I mean, Fred taught you how to throw a baseball. He's a really nice guy and you really like him. And he makes some off the wall comment because the tail hook report has just come out. And he says, gosh, I don't know about that tail hook report. I mean, what were those women doing at that drunken brawl anyway? And you've got to explain one more time how women should not be physically assaulted, even if they're at a drunken brawl. And why should women who are in the military be having to avoid those kinds of uh, professional societies and, and the organizations and all of the discussion that goes with that? You can make a difference. What I want from each of you is a pledge that you're going to take the next step. Whatever the next step is for you, it may be very small. For some of you, it may be just um, deciding that you're going to talk to one person or that you're going to speak up one time. But take the next step and uh, join into this movement because it's making a huge difference. Has feminism made a difference in women's lives? Absolutely. But there is so much more that needs to be done. And in the same way that we began this century by winning the right to vote, I want us to end this century by taking real political power. Thank you. Island has agreed to take some questions. We have a microphone here and a microphone here. We would appreciate it if uh, people that would, I don't think there are any up there, but there are two here. If people would like to ask a question, please step to the microphone. I appreciate it if you would identify yourself and, uh, and let's try to make sure that the questions are questions. <laughs> I think he just precluded me because I have a request. You have absolutely done a great service to this country particularly in this past year. It's been proven that with your help, the Clinton administration and other and the Congress have definitely benefited by having greater representation. Um, my request to you as an alumni of the school, I'm Stacy Richards, I graduated a couple years ago, and I'm a member of the Alumni Council now. Um, we've been asked by the dean um, to try to identify more women and people of color that might be faculty members here at the school. It's recognized far and wide that we are public policy leaders. We're being trained to be even better. And we have a problem here at the school. And I'm wondering if you could either help the dean personally through your vast network and understanding of this issue, or even help the alumni council in the school to try to indeed identify those people who are qualified um, to serve in this faculty. Well, let, let me, um, I did read some very interesting data about women and the faculty here. <laughs> or women not in the faculty here. Um, I would urge you also to speak with the Massachusetts now coordinator, Ellen Converser, the Boston now coordinator, Ellen Zucker, or presidents, whatever your titles are, um, because I think that, that um, they could also be helpful. Um, but let's talk separately and see what we can get going. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Sandler. I work here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for coming. My question is, you spoke about not being complacent and about working from the inside. What is the prognosis in light of the change of the administration to one that is more sensitive, although not as much as one would hope, um, to, for the 21st Century Party? And how, um, how does a third party really fit into politics of today? The, the party that she's making reference to, the 21st Century Party, was just formed last August. It's a feminist <laughs> party um, that is uh, designed to um, hold candidates accountable since we've found, and this is in part answer to your question, we found many of the candidates um, who run, for instance, for the Democratic Party actually run away from rather than on the platform. Um, it will be financed by its members. It will be um, adopting a platform. There's a platform in draft. And it was designed, I think, initially um, to make there be some competition for the feminist vote. 
Uh, we felt for years that the Republicans had written us out of their platform and the Democrats took us for granted. One of our national board members, I thought, put it rather succinctly when she said, you know, the Democrats come around and sweet talk us every two years and then they don't respect us in the morning. Um, <laughs> I think that the role of the 21st Century Party right now, when in fact there is a change in administration that is much more open to our issues, um, and, and uh, you know our calls are returned, uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous difference in accessibility. But I think that what we need to do with the 21st Century Party is take on the religious right wing at the grassroots. They, um, while they did not win the presidency, um, did win some 40% of the Christian coalition candidates at the state and local level. They've taken over many school boards, for instance, and are pushing on uh, curricula and, and uh, teachers and uh, what's taught in the schools, what's in the libraries in the schools. I think that the, that the new party could run successfully candidates at the local level, which would also move us toward building a party from the ground up. Um, having a real strong uh, network around the country of people who support those issues and where the Democrats and the Republicans offer us a choice similar, for instance, to what they offered us in Louisiana for the governor's race there where you had David Duke on the one hand and Edward Edwards on the other. Edwards who had um, said about himself and David Duke were both wizards under the sheets um, and who had been indicted so many times and whose integrity was so questioned that the bumper sticker from that campaign that I will always remember said, vote for the crook, it's important. And it was important to get rid of David Duke, but where those are our choices, I don't think there's anything to be lost by moving forward with a new party and having new candidates that would give us a real choice. Hi, my name's Jillian Dickert. I'm a staff writer with the case study program here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm very interested in your, uh, in your str uh, strategy for promoting women candidates that you used last year. As far as I know it, you focused on a few states and you uh, basically flooded the field with women candidates, and I understand California was one of them, and you did quite well there with two women in the Senate. Um, <laughs> um, I was um, wondering if you're going to um, continue with that strategy uh, in the future, and if you've looked at all at Massachusetts and how we haven't done so well <laughs> comparatively. Um, where are you heading with that? We um, have been working on a strategy of flooding the tickets, recruiting as many feminist uh, women to run as possible for as many offices as possible. And it's paid off dramatically. We make quantum leaps in that way. We've also, uh, in 1992, engaged in what we called a coordinated feminist campaign so that California, as an example, with one campaign phone call or lit drop or uh, campaign event, we could campaign for Boxer, Feinstein, uh, Lynn Woolsey in the Congress. There were women running in that congression in, in her uh, Senate area that were um, running for state assembly as well and pick up a few women judges besides so that you could, with one campaign office, work for five or six women at the same time. It was very successful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that we will be continuing that. We are fortunate enough to have um, on our national PAC um, Ellen Convisser, who is the president of Massachusetts now, and you should probably talk to her about lobbying on behalf of Massachusetts. We do target based on uh, the importance of the state in national politics. How many electoral votes does it have? How many members of Congress? Where is the population? Um, what chances do we have? How much of a strength do we have to build on? And I would say in Massachusetts, we have a very good now base to build on and a good base of activism from a number of other organizations and causes. So it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Eaton. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School and a former union negotiator and, and organizer. And my question is really about occupational segregation and about alliances between the feminist and the labor movement. And I have learned some numbers here at the Kennedy School, and I've learned that 92% of all jobs are either 80% male or 80% female, and also that 80% of women are in non-professional jobs uh, rather than professional jobs and are in the jobs that are less paid, as we all know, and less, have less opportunities for advancement. What really can we do, either as students, as workers, as professionals, as, as public policy leaders, and how do you see the alliances that need to be made between working women's organizations and now, which sometimes aren't seen as the same thing? Well, you ask a number of, of interesting questions there. I think that, for instance, in Congress there, we worked um, over a number of years on a package of bills. It's really an omnibus bill called the Economic Equity Act 
that includes um, all kinds of important programs for employed women. Um, uh, training programs, uh, part-time workers getting benefits extended to them where they're not covered right now, um, all the way from job training up to retirement, pensions, uh, and Social Security reform. I think that needs to move forward in Congress, but I think that we have focused perhaps too much on government as the only powerful institution. Now, it is very powerful. It has lots of money that it takes out of your pocket and my pocket, has police powers. Um, it is a very powerful institution. At the same time, I think that if we look at certain corporations um, that we could very, uh, we, should, we should turn some attention to the private sector and not ignore the impact there. Just as one example, the Family Medical Leave Act, which was held up for so long, was held up not because of the men in Congress, but because of the people behind them pulling their strings, the, the U.S. Manufacturers Association, the Chamber of Commerce, all of whom kind of folded after they lost, the, after this uh, change in administration. Um, so I think that we should look at more direct action uh, directed toward the corporations, the employers, um, you have an example here in, in Massachusetts that was very, very uh, creative, and that was the um, Everett cafeteria workers who brought an action because the cafeteria workers who were in those categories of predominantly females were um, so much less paid than the custodial workers, almost all of whom were men. Um, and when the jobs were evaluated, they found that they were very similar in terms of experience and work conditions and responsibility. And with the support of the custodial workers, those women took um, uh, Everett to court and won. Um, I think litigation strategies are important. I think that the alliances with the unions are very important. We often um, have, especially I think in Massachusetts, have had some good results working jointly uh, with, with organized labor. Uh, at the same time, we sometimes have our differences there, like differences in family, uh, that I think we can uh, profit from working together and, and figure out some strategies jointly. I don't think they're going to come easily, but I think that they're, they're quite possible. I think sexual harassment is a key organizing issue um, for all of us, and especially in the, in the workforce, it, is, it cuts across all kinds of lines, and it is um, devastating to women, and I think that's one of the ways that we might work jointly. My name is Rebecca Eisenberg. I'm a third-year law student, I'm about to graduate next month. Um, if I've learned anything over the past three years, I've learned that uh, the law doesn't do much for women, and um, I've become increasingly disillusioned and frustrated with what the law um, does not do. For example, rape is supposedly illegal, but women are getting raped at epidemic levels. Same with sexual harassment, same with you know, ev everything else. Um, what I'm wondering is what strategies can be done apart from making new laws that aren't going to be enforced getting new consent degrees that at, at the courts for affirmative action programs that aren't going to be enforced. Um, what can we do maybe through the media or maybe through educating children where people start to believe that women can work as construction workers, our breasts don't get in the way, or that women, you know, women can uh, fight, can shoot a gun. How, what can we do besides the law to, to make some real change is what I'm asking. Well, I wouldn't, first of all, I wouldn't throw out the law as a strategy. Um, and I know that it can be very frustrating and it can be very slow. I think it was very significant, for instance, on the issues of sexual harassment that we just won both the right to a jury trial and damages under Title VII in this past year. It was a direct result of the Anita Hill confrontation with the U.S. Senate and the outpouring of public support uh, for women in the workforce and against sexual harassment that meant that the president, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name already, Bush. <laughs> hmm. That President Bush, who had vetoed the bill before, it's not nice to laugh at people who are absent-minded. Um, Bush, who had vetoed the bill before calling it a quota bill, suddenly decided, no, it was really a civil rights act 
after that, after that Anita Hill confrontation and the outpouring of support and signed it. And we want a right to trial by jury and damages. We also want a right to damages in a case of sexual harassment under Title IX and equal education. And believe me, the next day, institutions around the country had their labor lawyers on the phone and they were setting up training programs and other means of compliance. Um, so I would not give up on the law. Yes, there are many ways that the law is limited and the law often has to reflect rather than lead public opinion. Uh, but I think that we can, and you've named all the ways, the, looking at education as one important institution where, where people's opinions are molded and where um, girls are shortchanged. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways that we can work and you just have to pick the area that is most interesting to you, most suited to your personality, um, and then just get in there. I mean, the strategies, I think, are still being hammered out, especially as we shift from the 12 years of Reagan and Bush to uh, the new administration. But um, I would not, as a third-year law student, throw out your law degree and think <laughs> that it's not, um, not able to be put to good use. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Marco Simonov. I come from the School of Public Health. Uh, we live in a world of symbols and a world of reality. What would you think of a university that invites General Colin Powell to be its commencement day speaker? That sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> uh, well, I think, you know, there's a, I have a lot of ambivalence about that. I think that the military has. Um, is playing a very difficult role right now, for instance, around the issues of lesbians and gays in the military. I thought it was just fascinating that the Senate panel was all male and that the two panels of witnesses were all men in that, in that debate. I mean, I, I think that the, um, having lived in Miami for 20 years and watched uh, with, with professional interest and, and practicing um, international business transactions out of that city, watched South and Central America for years, I'm particularly aware of the role of the military as a separate political institution, and I think that it's dangerous when we see the military bucking the, the commander-in-chief in so many ways. It's not just lesbians and gays in the military. Right now, for instance, with Bush having lifted the ban on privately funded abortions in military hospitals, we find that every military doctor in Europe has refused to provide that procedure. And so the women in the, in the military, and I think there's only one doctor in Asia, I mean, there's resistance all throughout the leadership and in the military, and I think that's very um, uh, frightening in some measure. On the other hand, uh, there, I think that it's important that we have uh, a free flow of ideas. I think that we need to get more in the habit of listening to each other. I think that the country has been so polarized um, that a lot of our discourse has moved um, beyond any ability to have a civilized discussion and into just screaming at each other over so many issues that uh, in some measure I think we have to respect Colin Powell as a, a man who as an African-American man has made a breakthrough. Um, uh, I would not go to hear him speak, but I think it's um, probably a different issue whether he should be invited to speak or not. I think in that sense perhaps it is the consumers who can show their displeasure um, unless it's a requirement to graduate that you go to the commencement. <laughs> oh, uh, my name is Kelly Knight, and I'm the um, executive coordinator of Women in International Development mm -hmm. at Harvard Inter Institute of International Development. Most of your talk so far has been on domestic issues. I realize now as a domestic organization, but I was just wondering briefly if you could talk about um, with the International Women's Conference in Beijing coming up in 94, what you see, what now sees as the biggest challenge to, um, to the issue of global feminism coming up, just a few issues, or, or what you think now's role in, in the implementation of global feminist theory is gonna be. I think that the issues on the global level are very much the same as they are domestically. Um, issues of women's health are universal. Violence against women is, a, is an unbearable burden uh, for women in most parts of the world, although it may be carried out in different ways in different places. Um, the double burden that women carry, I have heard women from Japan and Cuba and the Soviet Union and Europe and Africa all talking about the double burden of work. Um, and, and so I think that's also fairly common, the economic empowerment that's missing. Um, I think what our role is, 
uh, is, uh, is really a two-way communication. We've begun in areas where I think we are learning a great deal from women in other countries. For instance, in Europe, they have a much higher proportion of women in their uh, parliaments than we do in the Congress here. Women in India who, from a position that, from the external view, look very powerless and who have done some tremendous organizing work on violence against women. Um, we have provided technical assistance and um, information to a lot of groups around the world on reproductive freedom issues because we are unfortunately exporting uh, the clinic attacks. We, um, in the fight for the Brazilian constitution, their new constitution, and in Philippines, U.S. anti-abortionists went down there and spent a year in Brazil organizing against having any reproductive freedom in the constitution for the women in that country. Um, and, and in fact tried to have an anti-abortion provision in there. The women in Brazil were very happy because they ended up with just an abortion neutral. That is, it doesn't say anything one way or the other. The Philippines, they got an anti-abortion provision in the new constitution. So we, we work both um, where we have expertise providing that and organizing assistance where appropriate. I've gone and given uh, you know, workshops and spent days with people, uh, with women in other countries. Um, I think that it's, um, the, the work that came out of the UN decade is so uh, deep at this point, and it's not to say that it's not without a tremendous struggle, but that women will not be pushed backwards in the same way that we've seen historically. I mean, I was in Kenya just before their first multi-party elections ever, sitting around a table with women. I could have been in the United States. I mean, the whole discussion was how do we get more women into positions of power? And they had a, a full weekend training session with women across party lines trying to figure out how to help each other move into positions of power. Um, I, I thought it was extraordinary, but I literally could have been at a, at a Boston now um, PAC meeting uh, in, in that situation. Um, my name's Ann Haberkern, and I'm a first year graduate student in history. And, um, I specialize in medieval history and I always love it when I get a course syllabus that has a list of 25 or 30 lectures and there's one lecture that's called Women in the Middle Ages, as if we're sort of 1 30th of what needs to be studied about the Middle Ages. And I was wondering if you could um, talk about what strategies now uses and what strategies we as individuals can use to fight against this idea that tokenism is enough, that that one lecture on women is enough, that, that um, President Clinton isn't really obligated to think about appointing a woman to take um, Justice White's seat because there's already a woman on the Supreme Court. And um, just what, what is now doing and what can we do to fight that impression that, that that's all that's needed? Well, I think first and foremost, we have to speak up. I mean, I think that um, it is, none of it's going to change easily. And recognize that when you speak up and push hard, there will be a price to be paid. Um, we, you know, there's ridicule, there's trivializing, um, there's all kinds of ways that people will fight back when you say, hey, one lecture out of 30 for half the population is really not adequate. Um, you get all kinds of interesting responses like, well, women weren't doing anything. Um, David and Myra Sadker, who are at the American University and in, in, uh, do research and are just finishing a book on gender bias in education, uh, present to the methodology class at the School of Education there um, out of a whole semester, let's say 30 lectures, they do two hours on gender bias in education and the students grumble that it is an overemphasis on the, on the issues. Um, so I think that, that it really does require women in those courses, women on those faculties um, to speak up, and men as well, to speak up and say, you know, half the population is being ignored. And um, oftentimes you can look for research support that shows what that does uh, to young girls, especially in education, but to all of us to have that whole half of the history left out. So talk back. We're going to make it the last one, but we have. Okay. Hi, my name is Ryan Foster. Um, I'm 13 years old and I'm from Michigan. I'm really young and um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to know, since I can't do a lot because, I mean, at my age, what can I do to help stand up for women's rights in my community? I, th 
think there's a couple of ways. One, of course, is where you spend most your time, and that is in school. And I think for a lot of us, telling the truth about our lives is, hello. <laughs> Somebody's just dying to get into the feminist movement here. I can, I can hear them knocking on the door. Um, for a lot, you know, a lot of the progress that we've made has been women telling the truth about our lives, whether it was the women in Tailhook talking about the sexual harassment or women coming forward who've been battered women and hearing one more time the question, why didn't you leave? Um, all of us who have told the truth about our lives, uh, uh, women have spoken out about having abortions. There are um, a number of high schools now where I know organizing is going on, and a lot of times what the, the young women there have done is talked to other of their schoolmates and talk to them about what it is that, what do they see as a problem. So that in Blair High School in Montgomery County, for instance, the young women there surveyed all the women in the high school and found that the young women were very concerned about sports equity and that they were not getting access to the gym. They didn't have as much of the resources in terms of equipment and time on the playing field and coaching. Um, and in fact, they provoked a study that went on for a year. They named some of the young women to the board of that study. And, and showed that it was like six to one the amount spent on girls' sports as boys. Um, but I think what I'm saying to you is that it's probably good to start talking with the people that you're with and find out what bothers them. In some places, it's sexual harassment in the high schools or in the schools where um, you know, the girls are poked and prodded and get their bras snapped and um, you know, called names and put down in all kinds of ways. I mean, they're, they're, I don't know what the circumstance you'll find in your school, but that to me seems like the easiest place to be in organizing. The other thing, of course, is that you can join a NOW chapter in Michigan, <laughs> and they would be thrilled to have your help. Uh, we're always looking, those of us who consider ourselves tired old feminists, uh, for the, uh, the next generation coming up. Thank you for being right, here. Thanks. Let me, uh, let me just say uh, one final word of uh, thanks. I know you will all join me, not only for a stimulating and informative evening, and not only for Miss Ireland's tireless work for American women and women around the world, but that for all that she's doing to make the United States a nation of which we can all be even more proud. Thank you.